Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Annalisa and today I am doing a wrap up of the Demonathon. This readathon was started by Yumi the Book Demon. She'll be linked below. The concept is that everyone who takes part comes up with a demon that they want to make a deal with. They can make a deal of any kind. It can be for something as simple as cuddles or as big as unlimited knowledge. I introduced mine a few weeks ago. Her name's Aurora, she's a purple red panda, and she is giving me cuddles and pain relief. And the idea is that your half of the bargain is to read these books. And the books are themed around other types of demons from around the world. So the first prompt is the Incubus and Succubus. This is to appease those demons who like it hot and adventurous in the bedroom and anywhere else they can manage. Read a steamy romance or book with a sex scene. For this, I read A Duke by Default. I got recommended this and a few other books from a Kwanzaa-thon video, I think it was called. I'll be linking it below, but I wanted to pick up more books by black authors, and this looked like one that might be up my alley. This main character is basically the heiress of a real estate firm. She is almost 30, like 28, I think, and has been unable to find a long-term job. She's only basically had internships and college, and her parents are kind of ragging on her for it because they are bankrolling her. Personally, I find that kind of understandable. I am being bankrolled by my parents, but I'm only 22 and they are still bankrolling her. They're just kind of getting tired of it. Anyway, she decides that for the summer, she's going to go be an apprentice for blacksmiths. She found this opportunity through her sister who runs a geeky blog and found this opportunity because geeks like swords and that is where the romance comes in because this guy which by the way they did a great job with the models for this because they are very much as described in the book which is really cool uh this guy is the armorer he's the guy who makes the swords at the blacksmith place and so this is all about her and him falling in love kind of falling in immediate lust and then dancing around each other weirdly for quite a while and then she finds out he's a duke because that's the whole little what's it called gimmick of this little series which is called the reluctant royals each of the people sometimes it's they're a secret royal and sometimes they're not a secret royal but usually but two out of three times i think they're a secret royal and uh that's fun I guess. I actually found the whole blacksmithing thing way more interesting than the modern nobility thing, but that's just me. And kind of correspondingly, I really shipped this couple way more at the beginning when he, she was just his apprentice at the blacksmith shop and he was just her boss who was extremely attracted to her and couldn't, you know, treat her normally like a regular human being because he was so attracted to her he had to avoid her he couldn't just be her boss normally because because he was so attracted to her which is a bit of a toxic trope and i didn't like that very much but once i suspended my disbelief of that not being an actual thing uh i enjoyed it for what it was uh and then the whole duke thing got introduced to the relationship and didn't really care for it after that their relationship just takes on a different cast as she tries to help him navigate this rich people world that she is from and while that may be a realistic unhealthy turn for a relationship to take I think if we can be totally unrealistic with the whole duke thing which by the way he's supposedly the duke of Edinburgh which the actual duke of Edinburgh is Prince Philip the queen's husband you could have picked a slightly more obscure duchy but if you can be unrealistic in that way I would much prefer <laughs> it to have been unrealistic in the way that in giving us a relationship we could have shipped through the entire book and put some other kind of less toxic obstacle. Anyway, other than that, I really liked it. I really liked the setting. I really liked the characters. I'm most invested actually in a side character who is the main character's sister and she is disabled. Uh, and she, as I said, runs this blog that's really big and I was actually thinking about continuing the series when I thought she would be one of the heroines, but it turns out she's only a heroine of a short story or a novella that's with the series. She's not part of the, there are only three books in the main series and none of them center on her. And of course my library doesn't have the novellas, it just has the full novels. So 
I'm probably not gonna bother with continuing this series or picking up the first one because this is the second one, but I did appreciate some things like uh, there's ADHD representation. The main character finds out during the book that she is that she probably has ADHD. She doesn't get officially diagnosed. She self-diagnoses, which I very much respect as a person who has had to self-diagnose and then get my doctor to agree with me. Issues like gentrification are addressed because her family is a real estate family and the area that the blacksmith shop is in is actively being gentrified and I really liked the local bookshop and the description of the Ren Fair that goes on because obviously a lot of business for blacksmith shop is with Ren Fairs and the types of people who go to Ren Fairs and the sex scenes that uh, provided the requirements for this prompt were okay. As I've said I'm a sex repulsed person so I have a weird relationship with sex scenes, but these weren't too bad. So kind of meh for me, but interesting and I liked the aspects of representation and looking at some issues that I hadn't seen addressed in fiction before, or at least in this very on the nose manner. Next prompt is yokai, which I talked about a couple of videos ago, are some of my favorite demons. Yokai can be vile when mistreated, but are truly silly creatures at heart. It's hard to be mad at something so ugly and cute. Read something fun and light to brighten their little hearts. So for that, I read eh, eh, I Could Pee on This and Other Poems by Cats by Francesco Marciuliano, the titular poem of which is I Could Pee on This. Her new sweater doesn't smell of me. I could pee on that. She's gone out for the day and left her laptop on the counter. I could pee on that. Her new boyfriend just pushed my head away. I could pee on him. She's ignoring me, ignoring her. I could pee everywhere. She's making up for it by putting me on her lap. I could pee on this. I could pee on this. <laughs> One of my favorites is nudge, 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 nudge. Your glass just shattered on the floor. It <laughs> It's just a collection of silly and really funny poems having to do with how cats are and why they are and how they be and how hilarious living with them is. Then we have the Shitani. The Shitani of East Africa is a strange, malleable shapeshifter. It may take many forms, but it is known for its unbalanced, unbalanced asymmetrical ways. Now, when I came up with the drawing for this, uh, it turns out that Shitani often come in the shape of various animals, so that's why it looks like a really weird giraffe. It's a giraffe that's like shapeshifting into something else actively, so that's what that is. Anyway, the prompt is to read a book that is weird, doesn't fit into a single genre, or is far outside your comfort zone. For which I read Lifestyles of Gods and Monsters by Emily Robertson. And I picked this one because, as you can see by the cover, it is uniting two very different themes of ancient with very modern. Hence the phone and the neon lights. So the concept of this is Crete in the time of the Minotaur with all the Minotaur stuff being real, including the being uh, descended from a, a human queen and a cow. Except in this version of the Minotaur story, we have social media and cell phones and cameras everywhere and it, the whole competition to kill the Minotaur is a reality show. This was introduced to me by a video from Kara. Once again, I read a lot of books she wrecks. We have fairly similar reading tastes. In this particular case, if you want to hear the good parts of this book and why you might want to check it out, I'm going to link her video below because I am very biased. <laughs> and um, while I do have some good things to say about it, she says the exact same good things but better and has more good things to say about it so I'm just gonna tell you the bad things. I gave this three stars on Goodreads because Goodreads uses the star system um, because I see value in it and I don't think it's actually a bad book I just think it's not a book for me basically because it I'm not I'm not triggered by mentions of sexual assault or descriptions of it because I've not been traumatized by that um, but beginning to talk about it is making me stim so it makes me uncomfortable um, so even just mentioning it lightly is stressful for me um, so 
I don't usually use trigger warnings specifically to not read books, but when a book has is almost entirely about sexual assault or it's a recurring theme or it's a recurrent danger that the main character or characters close to her is under that it's extremely stressful for me um and so that was a huge theme of this book and so I wasn't able to relax enough to enjoy it enough to enjoy the good and interesting parts I am not able to really do this book justice in a review basically the person running the reality show that is the Minotaur uh, maze running thing is the King of Crete, Minos, and uh, the main character is Ariadne. We get told the story from her perspective. She is not in control of anything, we're told that right away. Um, she doesn't like the part she has to play, she is the keeper of the maze, so she goes down and comforts the Minotaur and makes sure he doesn't make earthquakes all the time, because he does that when she doesn't do anything about it. And she also leads the contestants into the maze because uh, no one else is safe to go in, the Minotaur will only not hurt her. And so she doesn't want to do this, but she has to and we're not sure why at the beginning but we find out later on why and it's a, a good reason and I can't really explain the rest um, without going into spoilers because um, Ariadne is not aware of the whole sexual assault themes going on around her until a ways into the book and it's kind of part of the big mystery that we're discovering and uncovering that things are a lot nastier than they seem like it's it's even nastier than somebody running a reality show hunger games thing it's it's get work it gets worse so and there's a particular scene that is not sexual assault exactly but it is a scene in which the main character's bodily autonomy is very much taken away physically and that scene upset me so much it's kind of imprinted on the back of my eyelids it was described in a fair amount of detail that was very upsetting so could not enjoy this book but it's very possible that you will if you read it I don't think there's anything wrong with including those things in a book it's just individual people have to guard themselves against it if that's not their thing but it'd be nice if there was some kind of rating system for how much of a book had sexual assault in it like if it's barely mentioned or if it's mentioned only in one scene I can deal with that I read the JD Robb books they and the main character has some bad things in her past that come up every once in a while in the books and sometimes there are rape murders but I'm fine with reading those because partially because of the way it's handled and also partially because there's so much else going on in the book that that is never that is very rarely the whole focus and it's it's never the whole focus sometimes it's a big focus if that's a thing with the murders that are going on but and uh, actually JD Robb does a thing where she adds extra really good side um, what are they called subplots in the books that have that so you can focus on that while all this nasty murder is going on um and so i don't know it would it would just be nice if there was like a rating system where just amounts that would trigger a person who's been traumatized doesn't bother me only when it's like the huge main focus of a book and it's only when it's handled in a very specific way does it bother me so <sighs> i can't just read trigger warnings and like avoid things that have that uh uh, yeah, so it's very difficult to like quantify that in such a way that I can protect myself And I don't know how to like institute a system for that like what percentage of this book Needs to have a trigger warning for that. For example One thing that I do know to avoid because people have talked about um, Because it's extremely popular and so eventually some of the people who've read it have actually talked about this aspect that the whole plot revolves around sexual assault and that is uh, Girls of Paper and Fire. Not everybody who reviews it brings it up. They bring up a trigger warning but they don't always bring up that that's like the whole thing that the plot revolves around is a harem and harems are you know by nature not consenting things so I will never read Girls of Paper and Fire 
because I know that it's like the whole thing is about that. It's not just one bit. Not upset with Kara or anyone else who recommended this book in any way, just to be clear. I think what she said about this book was definitely true and she brought up a lot of really good points that were really good and that was the reason I wanted to read it. So I am glad that I read it because I like to like experience really weird books because I'm a writer and I want to have like a lot of variety in my head of different ways that stories can be told. So I'm glad that I read it. I just, it's not going to be a reread and it's not going to be like remembered fondly. It's going to be rem remembered informatively. I put some more details about my feelings on the specific ways that these issues were handled in my Goodreads review. Uh, so if you want like specifics on that, I will link that as well. But if you like want to hear the good things about the book, definitely check out Kara's video. She did a great job recommending it. And it was definitely very well suited to the Shitani prompt. It was really weird and uh, unique in my opinion. Next prompt is the Wakufe. The Wakufe is a spreader of lies and deceit hailing from South America. This malevolent spirit leaves broken humans in its wake, but may be of use to those who bargain correctly. Read a book with secrets or lies. And for that, I picked Percy Jackson and the Olympians, book one, The Lightning Thief. So I decided to finally, I actually meant to read this in December, but I've, that's upside down. I'm finally got around to it in February. And this suits the prompt because who Percy Jackson's father is, is a secret at the beginning of the book. And so is his whole, you know, demigod thing. That's all a secret. And um, there's various betrayals and mysteries going on in this book as well. Personally, I was a little underwhelmed. Not because it's bad in any way, I actually think it's really good, but it was hyped heavily. So slightly underwhelmed for the amount of hype. Like I don't think it's better than a lot of my other favorite middle grade books. I think it's a good middle grade book. I really like middle grade and I really like the way that this was done. Um, I really like the characters. Annabeth is really cool. I expect to become a Parker Beth shipper because I will be continuing the series. And I am looking forward to all the other really interesting characters that I know are going to be introduced because it's been talked about online excessively how good representation is in the series. And so I am looking forward to that. And I also appreciate the representation in this book because apparently basically all the demigods have ADHD because that's just a thing that they have. It's meant to help them deal with fighting scenarios, which I don't know how true that is, but I think people with ADHD are extra good at video games. So it would make sense that they would also be good at reacting to things in a fight scenario, a real life fight scenario, or a magical fight scenario, which is the type that they get into. But a physical fight scenario, that's what I meant. And most of them are also dyslexic. Uh, because they were meant to read Greek, which no doesn't make any sense, but I am willing to suspend my disbelief for the magical uh, aspect of it because they're meant to read Greek in a magical way, not like, yeah. Anyway, my dad's dyslexic. I really like dyslexic representation, like extra to the amount I like other types because it's personal to me. Anyway, the character of Percy Jackson is interesting and fun. I can kind of tell from the way it's written that it is intended to be a book that would like age with the protagonist where it's gonna t they're gonna turn more YA as the kids grow up because this was slightly old for this was aimed at a slightly older audience than most of the middle grade books that I read. That's hard to explain because obviously all people of different ages are good at different levels of literature but it is intended for a more advanced reader it seems to me than a lot of middle grade books are just slightly slightly it's definitely meant for a less advanced reader than a lot of YA books so it's kind of one of those transition books I believe a lot along the lines of Harry Potter where the books get more intense and longer etc as the children in them age up. But I'm not going to go into it too much more than that because you've probably heard a lot about this series. But if you haven't read it and you like middle grade, I would recommend it. And if you don't like middle grade but you like fantasy and might be interested in reading more middle grade, I would recommend it because as I said, it's kind of a bridging 
thing. It's kind of on its way to being YA, so it might be something that someone who usually prefers YA would enjoy. Then we have Eudaimones. The Greeks have known about good demons for a very long time. The greatest artists, athletes, and philosophers often had Eudaimones on their side, like a demonic muse. Read something inspiring. And so for that, I picked Becoming. And I <laughs> took the longest with this one because it was the most boring. No offense, Michelle, but nonfiction is usually more boring than all the fantasy I was reading. And also, it was the most dense. This is slightly over 400 pages, but there's almost no dialogue, and there's a bajillion words on each page, as you can see. So it took a long time. So the extra time I had left over <laughs> from uh, reading, I could pee on this for one of the prompts I put towards reading this a little slower. This memoir follows her life from when she's a little girl to when she and her husband leave office. It was really interesting to see her background and find out where she'd come from. Everything from the way she grew up in Chicago to being super brilliant and successful at Princeton to being a rich lawyer was totally foreign to me and I really enjoyed hearing about her relationship with Barack Obama. She was fairly open about it and she really let us into her life and her thoughts and her feelings on a lot of things and that makes her feel a lot more real and just makes me admire her even more than I already did. And hearing about her time in office was also really interesting. Uh, it actually made me realize how accurate the show West Wing is because a lot of the things that they portrayed and the ways they portrayed things like campaigning and back and forths between the first lady staff and the uh, president staff and um, talking to foreign dignitaries and just a lot of things were very much the same way in the show as she described them uh, from her experience in the White House so that was really interesting and I will enjoy that show even more next time I watch it and I really appreciated all of the things she had to say about being black and being a woman and how she tried to bring more diversity into the various privileged rooms she was able to get into through hard luck and talent um, where she was usually the only black person and the only woman because other people who worked just as hard as her and uh, harder than a lot of the white men in those rooms had been denied those opportunities simply because of what they looked like. And I was also really interested in all the ways that she affected policy during her time as First Lady. I also really liked when she described her meetings with the Queen because um, the Queen is a very private person and relatively uh, doesn't talk on the news a lot, and doesn't like make a big show of her personality. So it was really interesting to see what she's really like in these personal interactions with other powerful women in the world because she actually is a really funny and nice lady apparently. So that's really cool. And I highly recommend it if you're interested in any of these topics and just if you want to be more informed, uh, citizen of America or citizen of the world. The next demon is the Jinn. It is hard to tame a creature made from fire itself. This Jinn may grant no wishes, but it's better to have one as your ally than as your enemy. Read an adventure-filled slash action-filled book to light their fiery spirit. And so for that, I picked Heartless, which is the fourth book in the Parasol Protectorate series. I read books two and three during January, right after I read the first one, which I talked about a little while ago. We get lots of steampunk technology in this book and lots of action having to do with it. There are some kind of war machine type things going on and uh, crazy stuff like that. And things are happening in her relationship with her husband and her relationship with my favorite character, who is Lord Akultama, who is a... Uh, effeminate gay uh vampire and he's he's just very cool i love him and this is just as hilarious as the first three books and things took a little bit of a dip uh happiness wise during the end of the second book and during the third book but we are back to happy contentedness in this book so uh, i enjoyed it a lot and it was very action filled with all the crazy monsters and adventures going on there were fights with some creatures that had been engineered by vampires. There were some fights with giant steampunk machines and werewolves and stuff like that because this is a paranormal romance. Once again, the main character of this uh, series is a female alpha type person and I really like female alpha type people. So uh, 
highly recommend it. And the last demon is the Raven Mocker. This creature feasts on the sick and dying, but its favorite meal is the heart of children, or so they say. What are you doing with the heart of children? Read an indulgent book to quell this demon's hunger. And the book I picked for that was Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik because I've been wanting to read this for a really long time and I've just kept finding reasons uh, that I ought to read other things. And I'm really glad I finally read this. Uh, it was super enjoyable. It took longer to get started than I expected, but it is 470 some pages, I think. I really enjoyed the exploration of um, old timey money lending in this. It is set in a fantasy version of Russia and several of the main characters are Jews who um, emigrated to there as refugees because the place where they had been living or where the main character's grandparents I believe had been living uh, suddenly became more dangerous for Jews and her grandfather is a moneylender and her father who is the son-in-law to that grandfather was also a moneylender but not a very good one in that he never asked anyone for their money back so the main character took over being the moneylender and it's a really interesting exploration of her emotions and the way she learned to be strong and not let people take advantage of her like her father had been taken advantage of it's really interesting and there are two other main female characters in this book and we trade off perspectives between those three and occasional uh, perspective changes to other characters but mainly the perspective changes between these three female characters and I adore them. They are so interesting and deep and strong each in their own ways and they form relationships with each other that are complicated but they care deeply about each other and they bond over basically being taken advantage of by other people and try to help each other just because they see that the other people are in trouble and that's really special to me. And this is partially a Rumpelstiltskin retelling. It's very vague and um, very much the bare bones aspects of Rumpelstiltskin are taken and this guy on the cover that you can kind of see when it's not being shiny um, is a king of the Serex who are ice people who are kind of sort of made of ice and they invade the local area the entire country actually of this Russian-ish place and they come in the winter and they like to steal people's gold for some reason that we don't understand and this is more explored throughout the book but they really love gold so because she is a money lender and she gets a reputation for turning silver into gold kind of like spinning straw into gold that's where the whole spinning silver thing comes from the steric king decides he wants her to magically or however she does it turn silver into gold for him so he provides her silver and expects her to give him back gold and she doesn't really have a choice in the matter and that's the main jumping off point for the plot where it really starts to get going and then we have her interacting with the steric king who is very used to getting his way all the time and she stands up to him really well and I really like that. The second female main character is a local girl who this lady takes in as a worker in her house because her the because her father owes money to the money lender and the only way that they can pay is to have her work it off and it actually becomes a shelter for this girl because her father is abusive and so she becomes friends with this character because she depends on her to keep her away from her father and then we are introduced to the third main character who is a daughter of a duke I believe of the closest big town where this character's grandfather lives and does his money lending and where she goes whenever she has to do big business instead of the little business she does in her village and so they are linked because the silver that the Stare King gives her to turn into gold is actually magical silver and she ends up selling it to the Duke in the form of fancy magic jewelry and the jewelry goes to his daughter to wear so that she can impress the Tsar of the country and get him to marry her and so she's not happy about this and so we go on the journey of her having to deal with the Tsar and this lady having to deal with the Star King and they eventually work together to figure out how to deal with these people who are 
not treating them very well. I'll, I think I'll talk to you about this more in the future because there are various aspects I want to explore, maybe in tag videos, maybe in topical videos, but I adore these female characters and I really love uh, just the whole story. It was just so excellently done. And there's just a little bit of Hades and Persephone retelling going on here, which I didn't figure out until 400 pages in or so. Uh, but I noticed a little bit, just a little hint of something that's a little bit like that. And that's my second favorite uh, story basis ever, second to Beauty and the Beast. So I really enjoyed that. And I really enjoyed the ending. It was a very good, very much just perfect perfect exactly how I would have done it or would have wanted it to be done so I just really love this author she's right up my alley and I really recommend it if you are interested in uh, Russian folklore or uh, money lending it was a really interesting exploration of that and how it should be done versus how it's done now with absorb exorbitant interest and people tricking people into things and it's just a really fun fantasy really creative and interesting and draws on some interesting concepts that I haven't seen much before. So that is what I read for the Demonathon. I'm going to be telling you what I read during the rest of February in my Valentine's wrap up that will be next week. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you check out the rest of the Demonathon videos going around and I will see you in the next video. Bye!